Truly, God's mercies are new every morning, aren't they? And great is his faithfulness. It's a joy to be with you all here this morning. We welcome you warmly in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we assemble together here for the worship of God, for the public proclamation and teaching of his holy scriptures, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and for the joyful Christian fellowship that we get to share here this morning. So we warmly welcome you. It is always a privilege to get together. As we like to say, there is no place that we'd rather be this side of eternity than right here with you all worshiping God. We do these things as we gather, not haphazardly, but we do them with a singular purpose when we gather here, and it's all for the glory of our God. So to prepare our hearts this morning, I'd like to read Psalm 63, verses 1 through 4, as we get ready to sing some songs and worship our God. So Psalm 63, verses 1 through 4. It says, God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you, and my soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. Amen. Let's stand as Michael and Amanda lead us in our opening song. Um, we're going to do uh, a reading from uh, Romans 16. Jeremy Lowe. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Mike. I'm just excited to sing, I think. Jeremy, thanks. We're going to be reading uh, Romans 16 here this morning. Brother, sure. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Romans 16. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the, of the church, which is at Centria, that you receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succorer of many, and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinetus, who is the firstfruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greet, salute Urbane, our helper in Christ, and Stachys, my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus's household. Salute Herodian, my kinsman. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Salute Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Patrobus, Hermes, and the beloved which are with them. Salute Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Salute one another with an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them, for they, are su for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil." And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Timotheus, my workfellow, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosipater, my kinsmen, salute you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Gaius, mine host, and of the whole church, saluteth you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you, and Cordus, a brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest 
and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Christ, through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Amen to that. Thank you, Jeremy. That's the word of God. You guys ready to get into some Romans 16 this morning? Well, let's please stand and welcome our teacher this morning, Sean Weir. Good morning. God bless you all. Please be seated. Good morning, PA Bible and guests. Love you and delighted to be together with all of you this morning to gather together in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you'd be so kind, would you all please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 16, the last chapter in this great epistle. And as we turn there, if you'd be so kind, I'd like to open briefly with a prayer. Righteous God in heaven, there is no one like you, full of holiness and glory. Father, we ask as we open this text this morning that you open us, Father, so that we might behold wondrous things in your word this morning. Help us, God, to see the tender affection that we can carry one for another as family, to let those uniting threads of your love draw us close to one another, where we can speak and think so kindly and lovingly of one another. Help us this morning to see the discernment and the wisdom we need to have to protect our family from those who would harm it. And help us, Father, to get caught up with Paul in the end of this chapter with sweeping glory and nothing to say but that you are so wise and you are so good and we are so grateful for this great gospel plan. We ask you to do this work in us this morning, Father, for your glory, for Jesus' sake, and in his name, amen. Romans chapter 16. I've been looking forward to sharing this text this Sunday for many, many months. I I love this section. It's very tender. It's very dear to my heart, uh, which may sound surprising after we've gone through like chapter 8 and chapter 12, which don't get me wrong, I love those chapters too. Uh, But this one in many ways shows us the real man behind the pen. We get to see the true heart behind the apostle of Jesus Christ, the gentleness that's behind his strength. And it teaches what the heart in ministry is to be towards the people of God who you have the humble privilege of serving. It's hard for someone to hear what you have to say unless they're first convinced that you love them. And with Paul, you can't miss it, can you? He's a great pastor. He'll he'll say the hard things that have to be said. But before all that, you see this. You see his tears. You see his longing. You see his affection. You see his sincere love. These things he writes, they're, they're no empty formula to Paul. This is truly his family. And he treats them as such. What we see here in Romans 16 is 1 Corinthians 13 applied with real people and real lives. One thing we see here that's quite precious is the audience that he's writing to, these people he personally sends greetings and his personal love to by name. Um, They're individuals like most of us, just commonplace Christians. They love the Lord and they're faithful. And so Paul recollects all of their names and he takes the time which is important to demonstrate you really care about that person. He takes the time which each and every one of them to greet them by name with love. We have such an unhealthy tendency, especially because of our celebrity worshiping culture, to forget that it's the real people in our actual lives who are the ones that we should pay the most attention to and show the most honor to. And you know, we, know, we know, you know, he's the Apostle Paul. He's rubbed shoulders with the big deals with Peter and James and John. And he shows those guys the due respect. He loves them too. But you see here how he pours out his personal love, his individual affection and honor for these real people who unless he named their names in this chapter, history wouldn't have remembered them. We saw this back in chapter 12, that part of a genuine love is acknowledging that it's the people who I know 
best in my life, who are the ones I should consider that it's my responsibility to love and honor more than anyone else. Why? Because I know them better than anyone. And so I should be the person before anyone who shows them the most honor and the most love. If they're hearing it from anyone, they should be hearing it most from me. So I encourage each of you as we go through this text, let it compel you. Let it spur some good affection in your heart to go home and write your own Romans 16 for the people who have been this to you in your life. And then have courage. Be like Paul and actually tell them about it. I'm very zealous to let people know how much I love them and how much I appreciate them. It's never to be conflated with flattery. These words must be sincere. They must be earned, or actually they can be more harmful than helpful. And, and it's also never in like a, a self-serving kind of way. Like, I'm giving you a compliment, but I also kind of packed my tackle box because I'm, you know, I'm fishing for one back. Never that. But I never want to be the man who loved you so much that I almost told you. And we see Paul certainly wasn't. And as a word of warning, life moves way too fast. Way too fast. Too easily we take it and that person for granted. The best words about your brothers and your sisters in Christ should not be saved for their eulogy. So I constrain you, everyone, think through your Romans 16 and tell those people today. In this chapter, we're going to see Paul send greetings to 26 individuals in the Roman church, 24 of whom he names by name. And in most cases, he's adding a, a personal and appreciative reference for them. 13 times in 16 verses, he tells them, greet so-and-so on my behalf. Would you do that for me? Extend my love and carry it to them for me? And we'll note, this is a diverse crew in race, in social status, in gender. We see side by side with the same affections and honor, Jews and Gentiles, nobility and slaves, males and female, side by side. Why? For they all have been made one in Christ Jesus. Paul preaches this. Paul lives this. Let's pick it up in verse 1. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister. The elders made me promise that I wouldn't spend 20 minutes on Phoebe this morning. So I'll spend 19. Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria, that you receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that you assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For she has been a sucker of many, and look at this, Paul says, and of me too. From this, it seems that Phoebe was the person who had the great privilege, the great responsibility, the great honor to carry the letter of Romans from Paul to this church of Rome. Can you imagine such an honor? She must have been a faithful woman, a reliable woman for such a task to be trusted by Paul. And we see here that she's from Centria, which is the eastern port of Corinth, which, as we know, Paul was wintering there as he was writing this letter. And he tells the church you're to welcome her, show her honor, and assist her in whatever needs she may have. I commend to you, I introduce to you Phoebe, which is a great name, by the way, the English root of it means a pure brightness. Uh, it's the same origin from which we get our words like photon or photography. And we see three notable things that Paul says about Phoebe. Number one, he says she's a sister. Note, he's, it, it's not just my sister. He's saying to all this church who he's never visited before, she's our sister, yours and mine. She's part of the family. Even if you've never met her, so treat her as such. Take care of her. She may have a need for a place to stay, for food, and for connections. She's your sister, and families take care of their own, so take care of her. Number two, Paul says she's a servant, which in the Greek is actually the female version of deacon. She's a deaconess. She's a ready servant for the work of the ministry, and she's proven, and she's faithful, one from the church of Corinth. And then thirdly, Paul called her a sucker of many. And specifically, this seems it could be in a large part for her giving generosity. 
to the work of the ministry. The word succorer could be actually better translated as patron. I'm sure many of you have heard the internet service Patreon, right? Whatever God gave to her, she gives to help others. She's a financial supporter or a benefactor to many. Which biblically, and in my experience, I have seen this grace very often in faithful women. Open and generous hands to give to the work of the ministry. Remember, it's the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, in fact, that was noticeably and largely financially supported by women, not men. So it may be well that she was a successful businesswoman, and perhaps she had business needs as well in Rome, kind of like Lydia in uh, Acts chapter 16, so maybe she needed to travel at times. And Paul is saying she's cared for me, she's taken care of me with my needs, helping to relieve them as she has for many others. Oh, so love this woman. Show honor to this woman and help her with whatever needs she may have. Now, some of you may have astutely just noticed that I have now mentioned both the names Phoebe and Lydia side by side in this sermon. Purely coincidental, I assure you. I'm just teaching the Bible up here. I've just got to find a way to work in a reference about Michael the Archangel, and I've completed the hat trick this morning. <laughs> Verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers, or my fellow workers, in Christ Jesus. You, you see that phrase, in the Lord, in Christ Jesus, all through these. Look at what he says of these two. They have, for my life, laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I am giving thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Uh, we know from the other scriptures, these guys come up all the time, never apart. We know that Aquila came from Pontus, which is on the southern shore of the Black Sea, that's northern modern-day Turkey. Then we know that he and Priscilla lived in Italy until Emperor Claudius expelled all the Jews from Rome in 49 AD. Then they moved to Corinth, where they meet up with a guy named Paul, and he stays with them since they were of the same occupation. They were tent makers together. Then they traveled with Paul from there to Ephesus. And now we see they have returned Rome. And they're not done. Later and finally we see them in 2 Timothy 4 back in Ephesus. And helping Timothy with the work there. What a couple. What a wonderful married group of saints. And they're a team. Never are they mentioned apart. And Paul says, both of them, both of them are my fellow workers in Christ. They didn't, like many do, get married and then just forget about everybody else. But they got married and they served the Lord Jesus Christ together in their marriage. And then Paul says, they risked the, their necks for my life. Both of them have done this. They both have laid down their necks on the sword chopping block. For, Saul, uh, for Paul to save his life. We don't know exactly what happened, but they saved Paul's life by risking their own. And so Paul says, so I give thanks, but not me only, all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. In other words, I'm alive today because Aquila and Priscilla put their lives on the line for me. And I want all of us as couples to see what they did as a couple. He doesn't say, well, Aquila did it because he was the man. He says they both have done it. They were in this together, ready to die for Paul together. Isn't that phenomenal? What a marriage. In fact, even we note here Priscilla's name is mentioned first. Why? Because they're one flesh. They're a team, one heart. I mean, come on, their names even rhyme. <laughs> I can't wait to meet these two one day. I love how good marriages spurn the enemy. That united heart, husband and wife, we're here and we exist and we draw breath. Our marriage is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. It gives glory to God, showing out what marriage was always supposed to be. Because as many as Adam and Eve's and Ahab and Jezebel's and Ananias and Sapphira's there are out there, we have Abraham's and Sarah's. We have Joseph and Mary's. We have Aquila and Priscilla's, and we have many in our church here today as well. Verse 5 continues, salute my well-beloved Epinetus, who is of the first fruits of Achaia, it should be Asia, 
unto Christ. He was the first one to receive the gospel there. Paul never forgot it. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. These two also appear to be married. And Paul tells us four things about them. First off, they're his kinsmen, meaning they're Jewish. Secondly, that at some point they were fellow prisoners for the sake of the gospel like him. And that they were converted to the gospel before Paul was, actually. And that they were highly esteemed by the rest of the apostles. So it seems these two may have actually been from the early days, right after Pentecost. Verse 8, greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ. And Stachys, my beloved. Salute Opelus, approved in Christ. And that one about Apelles always strikes me. What approved in Christ must have meant for him to read. What did that do for his soul in that moment and for many years afterwards? Paul knows him personally. These words are by the Holy Spirit's inspiration. For him and that whole church in Rome to know whatever may have been before, whatever may have happened, whatever accusations may be, this man, despite challenges, is a man who's approved in Christ Jesus. You know, some single phrases and sentences of encouragement will be words that people will hold on and it'll give them confidence for the rest of their lives. That's what family does for each other. That's what Paul's doing for his brother. Salute them which are of the house of Aristobulus. Salute Herodian, my kinsman. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. All of these are fascinating, and we could spend three hours considering historically how these guys come up in works of antiquity. But some things of note here. Aristobulus is strongly suggested by scholars to be the grandson of Herod the Great, a well-known individual who is a friend of Emperor Claudius. And there are two noted Roman historians, uh, Tactus and Suetonius, who mention a house of Narcissus that was in Rome at this time. It was a very famous house. It was a very wealthy house, likely the same. There's another reliable source from antiquity that mentions a guy named Stachys, who was also found in the royal palace of Rome. We know later in Philippians chapter 4 that Paul will mention Christians especially sending greeting who are in Caesar's palace. Which was, of course, where? Rome. Not Las Vegas. Rome, right? And isn't it exciting to think that perhaps some of these were those individuals? Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Look at this. And his mom and mine. Well, who's Rufus? Well, you study night fans will remember that it seems Mark most likely wrote his gospel in or for Rome to this Gentile audience. And he specifically mentioned in his gospel a man named Simon of Cyrene. And it tells us the names of his sons, implying that they were already well known to the readers in Rome. I'll remind you, this is Mark 15. They compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus as he was coming out of his country and passing by to bear the cross. So this Rufus, it seems very likely, is one of the sons of Simon of Cyrene, who carried Jesus' cross for him to Golgotha. That's your dad. And apparently, Simon married quite well as well. Because Paul says, his mother is like a mother to me, too. It's one of the dearest things about the family of God, right? Many fathers and many mothers and many brothers and many sisters. Salute Asyncritus, Legellan, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philologus and Julia, Nerus and his sister, and Olympus and all the saints which are with them. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Uh, this with a holy kiss. Um, don't get too nervous. Uh, It implies that our verbal greetings should be confirmed by a physical gesture of warmth and honor. And this, of course, will vary from culture to culture. But for them, this was their common gesture of greeting to one another. Uh, If you remember, there's a record where Jesus once rebuked a Pharisee uh, because he did not give Jesus a kiss when he came into his home, right? And yet there was this woman who they all despised despised, and yet she didn't stop 
to kiss his feet and anoint him. For those of us who live in the West, um, I think J.B. Phillips has a great paraphrase that handles this well for our time and culture. Phillips wrote, give one another a hearty handshake all around for my sake. The point is, it's not just words. There's also a follow through of physical affection because of how dear you've become in Christ to my heart. And then he says, all the churches of Christ salute you. Isn't it? that awesome? We're all on the same team. We're all working and striving together. We don't see each other as competition, but we are encouraged and we're saluting you. Good job standing, Romans. We salute you. And now we come to this point where, again, we think, well, Paul's finally done with Romans, but he's only rounding third. And what follows then after all this heartsy stuff may seem like a hard tonal shift, and it is. But it fits in line with everything we saw from his heart before. See, Paul really sees these individuals in Rome as his family. And if you really love your family, you do so heartily, which means like this in very tender and affectionate ways, you nurture them and you care for them. But also if you really love your family in very fierce and in very firm ways, you defend them from those who would harm them. Paul's being a good pastor here and a faithful shepherd. Look at verse 17. Now I beseech you, brothers, mark them which cause divisions and offenses. It means create obstacles or stumbling blocks. Contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and do what? Avoid them. So we see Paul in these verses now give this threefold appeal. Vigilance, Separation and discernment. Vigilance, because he calls them to watch out. Be on guard against these individuals. Wherever the good seed of the kingdom is sown, the enemy tries to come in and sow tares as well. Watch out. Separation. Don't miss this. Separation. Paul calls for severance. Keep away from those individuals. They're only coming to hurt. And then thirdly, discernment. There's two kinds of obedience. There's blind and there's discerning. And Paul wants them to develop the latter. Be discerning. Have wisdom. Be able to tell the difference between genuine and false. Be wise about what's good and innocent, but also to be able to tag and identify what is evil so that you're not easily deceived. And so that you're able to protect your brothers and sisters from people who are only coming to hurt. Why such drastic measures? Because these individuals cause only two things, divisions and defenses. Division, it's the Greek word that means to stand apart. And that's what people who cause division do. They separate people from the rest of the flock and get them to stand apart with them. This is an old ploy of the enemy. You see predators do this. You ever watch nature documentaries and you see like the lions right, crawling and getting in the tall grass? And how do they get to some of those gazelles so they can gobble them all up? They have to separate them. And notice they usually prey on the weak ones. Yeah? And so there are people who serve Satan just like this. There are wolves coming for the flock. And they speak, they speak smoothly. They sound good. It goes easy on the ear. In fact, it it often looks like they might actually be the ones who are the most devoted, the most genuine. It looks like they're doing the most biblical thing. It looks like they're one of the strong, like we saw in Romans 15. But it's because they work by deception. And it's because wolves come in in sheep's clothing. And offenses means that which causes sin. And in instances with this, most often it's slander, in these kinds of situations. Evil speaking of fellow ministers and Christians, and they come to you quietly and they say, hey, hey, I I just, I have these concerns. Notice they never want to talk to leadership about it, just you. Why? Because they want you and to separate you. They want to make merchandise of you. They don't love you. They love themselves. And they cause these things, meaning they don't just do this privately in their own life, but they're influence others to join in with them and follow them. Hey, come over here and be the more spiritual person with me. Join me in my disunity and my offenses against the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
That's how you identify them. How do I know? Because they're the ones who cause disunity. Because they're the ones who cause people to stumble. And it's all contrary, it says, to the doctrine. The doctrine that teaches us that everything is about the gospel. The dying and the rising and the returning of Jesus Christ. The doctrine that makes us how many? One. In Christ Jesus. And so if they separate from and hinder or push against that, usually with very spiritual sounding reasons, how can I tell? By knowing the doctrine you can tell. And it's not hard. And then what do we do? We avoid them. We separate them. There's a deliberateness about this. And it doesn't say we hate them, but it does say we need to avoid them. I find this is challenging for people. Of course, Satan doesn't try to make this clean. But we need to be very wise about these kinds of things and these kinds of individuals. Any time that there's a great work of God, any time there's a great outpouring of light, bugs are attracted. They need to be swatted. And that's what you have to do. And we love, we want everybody to come to repentance in the gospel of Christ. It's actually the most loving thing for these individuals. So that they might have an opportunity to repent. And it might be a story of redemption. Just like my life is. Just like yours is. But these same instructions are all through the scriptures. Boy, it took a sudden serious tone, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. We'll get to high and glorious things to close. But this is crucial. Why? Because we love our family. So we need to protect our family. Consider some of these parallel scriptures with me. Titus 3.10. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with them. 2 Thessalonians 3. If anyone doesn't obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing more to do with them so they might be ashamed. 2 John 1. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching... Do not receive them into your house. Do not give them any greeting, for whoever greets them takes part in their wicked works. In fact, Paul gave very similar warnings to this on the shores of Miletus to the eldership of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. He said, I know that after I depart, fierce wolves are going to enter in among you, and they're not going to spare the flock. They will come from among your own selves. And they will arise and they will speak twisted thing. And he says what their goal is. He tells us what their agenda is. It's always this. To draw away disciples after them. Why? Because it's about them. And their pride. They love to be called teacher. Mark them and avoid them. All through the New Testament it tells us. What do you do with a divisive person? What do you do with a person who wants to just slander and argue? Don't! Walk away from them. Avoid them. Reject what they say. And move on. They want to make it all about them. Don't allow it to be. Make it clear it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. And this does not serve him. All with hopes that they might be ashamed. That they may repent. And that they also would have a chance for redemption and restoration. This sounds pretty harsh, Sean. Why do we have to be so severe with them? Can't we all just get along? No, they won't allow it. Their flesh won't allow it. Their pride won't allow it. Look at verse 18. This is why. Because they don't serve our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why. Because I'm all about him. And my whole life is about serving him. They serve their own belly. Isn't that a great figure? Me, 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 me. It'll never look that way. Wow, look, that guy is like. So sincere. Discern a little bit better. You'll see where the glory is really going. And by good words, which means smooth talk and fair speeches or flattery, they deceive the hearts of the simple, oh, of the naive. Why? Because they're predators. They're after the naive. And these are their tactics. Smooth talk, convincing words, fair speech. Fair speech is actually eulogia. It's usually the word used in scripture for speaking words of blessing. But they're not saying these things from a sincere heart, right? It's flattery. But they're after you to make merchandise of you and to draw you away from the congregation. Simple means they're after the pure-hearted people. They're after the innocent, the harmless people. In my experience, it's not usually the people who get caught up with them who are the problem. They're usually really wonderful Christians. 
They're just naive. They just don't know what's actually going on in that situation. And that's why these predatory individuals come after them in the first place. Paul says none of their motives are to serve Christ but their own belly. It's for their pride. It's for their power. It's for their accolades. They love to be called teacher. They love to have people tell them how wonderful they are because that is their true master, themselves, their belly. They don't care about you. They just care about their agenda and their ego. So to be clear, dividers and deceivers, they will never present themselves as selfish people. Typically, they perceive and present themselves as noble crusaders for a very important Christian cause. But however they may appear on the outside, we need to be wise. We need to be discerning. And the doctrine makes us so that their motives are actually just selfish and fleshly on the inside. Look at verse 19. Why does Paul say this so severely in the end to the Romans? Because they have a reputation now. Your obedience has come abroad unto all men. Romans, everybody knows about you. So you especially need to stand strong. And I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you to be wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And then great comfort comes after those hard statements. And never forget... The God of peace will bruise or crush Satan under your feet very shortly. That's sooner than it's never, ever been. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And the whole church says, amen. And again, we think Paul's done. He's not done. (laughs) But especially in these very unpleasant matters that in dealing with these kinds of individuals who cause division, I find these words right here to be very comforting. And if we lose sight of this, we can get swallowed up by just how hard that is. And how challenging those matters can be. Because that verse reminds us again who's truly always behind all of these things. It's never just flesh and blood. And that helps us also just have compassion on these individuals. They deceive only because they themselves are deceived. And so at that point, the most loving thing to do for them is to give them over. Separate them so that they might repent and be redeemed, restored. And you need to remember, if they believed on Christ at the end of the day, as wicked as they may be, they're not your enemy. They're still your brother and your sister. And so then when Paul says, the God of peace will crush Satan, uh, there's kind of a purposeful irony in that statement, right? Peace will be crushing the enemy. Why? Because when that's accomplished, you know what it's going to do? Make for great peace. When all that was promised before in Genesis 3.15 we'll see its final fulfillment. The lasting effect will be peace. And that also serves as one last warning. Not to be cozy and not to play with and not to be friends with evil and those who promote it because all their evil will very soon lose. And then, stay vigilant. Church, watch out until that day because all of their lies one day, very soon, will be destroyed, just like the father of lies himself will be. Isn't that comforting? Yeah. And then what's in Christ will stand forever. Well, now Paul sends greetings on behalf of eight individuals who are there with him in Corinth. And it gets sweet again. Verse 21, Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosipater, my kinsmen, salute you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Uh, Tertius was Paul's secretary uh, as Paul's dictating Romans and Tertius wrote it down. And you know what the name Tertius means? It means third. Uh, You know, we say primary, secondary, and tertiary. There's also a man in Acts chapter 20 who was going to be accompanying Paul right after this, uh, and his name was Secundus. Can you guess what his name means? (laughs) Second, yeah. Do you know why they were named that? Because they were slaves likely from infancy. And so to the world, they didn't even have names. They had numbers. And how beautiful is this redemption then, what we find in Christ? The dignity and the value it gives to human beings. They're nobodies to the world. A thing and not a person. And yet now, they're beloved ones in the Lord. No one even had a heart to name them a real name beyond two or three. But Paul loves them as his own family, his beloved brother. And can you imagine? Your name is third. And you got to write down the book of Romans. 
Isn't the gospel glorious? Paul's longest letter, the Magna Carta of Christianity to the world, and here you are mentioned right next to names of people in Caesar's palace. I love it. Gaius, my host, and of the whole church salutes you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, salutes you. And Cordus, you know what his name means? Fourth, the brother. Now, if any of you have a King James or a New King James or a NASB, you have a verse 24 after this. But if you have an ESV or an NIV, that verse isn't there. And it actually shouldn't be. It's not in the manuscripts. But Paul still wasn't done with Romans yet. Because he then ends Romans with this beautiful doxology. Now unto him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. First, he mentions Glory be to God, who has, through the power, who has the power to establish you according to my gospel. It is no accident that the book of Romans begins and ends with a reference to the power of God through the gospel. That the gospel is God's power to save, like we saw in chapter 1. And then here we see in chapter 16 that the gospel is God's power also to establish us, to strengthen us. To make us steadfast and lasting in the Christian faith. The Greek word for establish is the same word that Luke would use of when Paul would revisit cities after his itinerary. And the gospel seed was sown there to strengthen those local churches. The gospel then is the power of God to make Christians firm, strong, stable, lasting in their faith. And secondly, he says, this is according to the revelation of the mystery, emphasizing the fact that this gospel contained truth that was hidden for long ages past, but now it is revealed, and now it's being made known. And thirdly, that this is to be preached, I love this, to all nations, to the entire world, all people that on earth do dwell, to bring them all to an obedience of faith. Like we saw in chapter 1, God is commanding all people from all nations to come to the faith of the gospel concerning his son. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then lastly, it's noticeable that this epistle from Paul does not end with his typical grace and peace ending, like so many of his other letters. But he ends it with, all glory be to God for his wise gospel plan. After this whole epistle now, where we've seen unfolding all of God's world view. Glorifying God for being so wise is where you just have to end up. And so this is what Romans has given us. This has been the joy of going through this with all of you for all of these months. It gets us out of our little lives and our our present five minutes, and it helps us to rightly have perspective like God wants us to see it. To look at all this world and all its brokenness and all of this creation and all of its groaning. And then to be able to even despite it and through it still understand the gospel plan. And that Gus, God is working. And that all that we need to do is stay put in this gospel truth. And how then that causes our hearts to just sing forth glories to God for his wisdom to send Jesus Christ to resolve everything by the gospel. Without this understanding, how do you make sense of this world? How can you look at humans and how we keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again? And generation after generation saying, no, this time we're going to get it right. And they make a hash of it just like every generation before them. This world is crying out. It's broken and it's ruined. The wreckage is everywhere. How else can you make sense of this until you get the instruction? from Romans, to see God's worldview. And then you see, even in all of this, his glory is being revealed throughout all of it. And everything here, yes, right here, right now, is going according to his gospel plan. Why? Because God is wise. And God knew that in his son was the way that all things could be resolved. And then every aspect of our life, real hardships, real pain, real suffering, 
We're understanding that God for a time is allowing these things. These things that are evil. And no one knows they're evil more than him. For he is all good. But he allows them for a time. He sees it and he knows it. And he's still working righteousness. His gospel is still the power to save. The gospel is still the power that helps a person stay put in all this craziness. And you can look around and you can see his work in judging, in punishing, in redeeming and saving. And all the while with the hope on the horizon. After this, no matter what it is, there is a glory coming not worthy to be compared. And so I find it so fitting to close here. As Romans, from beginning to end, was all about the gospel plan, it ends us with praising him for being so wise and so glorious to accomplish it all in his son. Chapter by chapter, we saw these things unfold. How the dying, the rising, and the returning of Jesus Christ is the only solution for the world's brokenness. That the gospel is the answer, and that's why we should not be ashamed of it. It's the answer that all the world, everyone you've ever met in your life, every problem they have, every pain that they, the answer is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we must have the courage to preach these things, to stand in these things as a church, to be seasoned and established and matured in it. And now, yes, we have walked the whole Roman road with Paul. We even read the chapters that nobody reads. I'm proud of all of you. And what do we do in close? We appreciate the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God through his whole gospel plan. And then as a church, and at the very last, we are left together with Paul, having our hearts with only one last thing to say. To the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. And the whole church says, amen. I love you all. What a joy and privilege to be through this with you. And God bless. <laughs>